I do know you. That was beauty. Mm. Thank you, Ray. Wow. Oh. So, really grateful to get to be here today. It's been really um, a pleasure to have these conversations with Seal Beach. I've just come to really appreciate and love some of the folks that show up as leaders here. What a beautiful community. And, uh, you know, we see what we have within us. And I've been, you know, sort of playing out there with Marjorie for many, many years. And to get to do this again with each other has been really a joy. And I'm really grateful for our friendship as well as the ability that we get to, I think, collaborate more as communities. We do so much alone. We do so much with the intention of thinking that, that the only thing that we work on is what's in, within these four walls. And what we do within these four walls can be spread out through bridges and connecting and collaborating. And I really appreciate that. And it lends itself to kind of a little bit of what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to start with a story. And, um, you know, words have power. We know that, right? And there's some words that have more power than others. So, um, John, you get to follow me, whoever the camera person is out there, because i got to step over here for just a minute, because I need some space for this story. Some of my stories I do. Um, a number of years ago, um, my family bought a trailer, and we decided we wanted to camp and our first trailer uh, was, gosh, why is it we just don't buy something small and simple? <laughs> oh, no. So we had this big trailer. It was our first trailer. We, I'd never had one myself. I grew up camping, but I'd never really um, had the opportunity to operate and maintain and manage you know, a house on wheels and all the things that come with a house on wheels. So, um, we got the trailer, we came home, we had to have a couple things done, so we put it in this repair shop, and my spouse, she's a former uh, firefighter, scared of nothing, really. I don't even know if fear is even in her vocabulary, honestly. It's definitely in mine when it comes to certain stuff, but in hers, not at all. So we hook up the trailer to the truck, we take it to the repair place, or we excuse me, we're at the storage and we're hooking up the truck and I'm taking off and I had just retired. And Janine was on her way, she had retired and she's now a school teacher. She said, just drive it over to the repair place. You'll be fine, just don't make sharp turns, you know? <laughs> and I'd never done that before and I thought, well, I can kind of, I think I can do it. It wasn't even that far away. It's probably five minutes from our place where we stored it. So. Um, she leaves, I get in the truck, I take off and I'm driving and I'm very, very aware that I am absolutely unaware about how long this thing is. And when it came to the total length, we're probably talking about 50 feet is what you know I'm driving. And I'm cruising, I come up to my first corner and I realize that I'm sitting here at the light, I don't know how far back, I am sweating like a farm animal. I mean, I, I have, my clothes are completely wet and I've been driving for approximately five minutes. <laughs> so we, I get, I'm able to get into the repair, has a long driveway that, a long drive that comes in and I, I, I pull in and I get out and I go, thank God I'm here, they can help me unhook. So I go in and I say, hey, I'm Bobby Becker, I'm here to drop off the trailer. And he goes, great, just unhook it out there and you know, we'll come out and pick it up and I went, you want me to unhook it? He goes, yeah, yeah, go ahead and do that. Now, you would think, being a new owner of a trailer, that I would have said, you know, I'm not that familiar with unhooking it, so could I get some help? Oh, no. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I'm thinking, I just don't even want to say that I don't know what I'm doing, because I'm a perfectionist, and perfectionists don't say I don't know. So I go out there. Now, I have unhooked it before, but not by myself. So I go out. And I'm like, okay, and, I, and, I, and I'm trying to unhook everything and I'm struggling to get the truck and off 
there's a ball that sits on the truck and the, and the hitch apparatus comes, comes over and attaches the ball. I couldn't get it off the ball and I'm jumping up and down on the truck and I know they're watching me <laughs> out the window. And I finally get the trailer off the ball of the truck and I unhooked everything that I could see. Now this is what's interesting, I'm terrified. So this is what happens when you're terrified. All your senses shut down, except the ones you need, which is running. But sadly, running is not something you want to do when you're unhooking the trailer. So that particular sense or ability isn't really something that I need in that moment. So I couldn't see, and I was very conscious of the fact that I, that I really couldn't see what was going on. So I went and got in the truck. I think everything's unhooked. I pull forward about six inches, and I come around to the back of the truck, and I go, it looks like it's not attached, but I'm not sure. So I shuffle between the truck and the trailer <laughs> just to make sure there's nothing between that's hooking the truck, because I'm afraid that I'm just going to take off in the truck, and I'm going to drag whatever is still hooked up to the tr the tr between the trailer and the truck. I get in the truck, I pull forward another six inches, and I come back and I shuffle again. And I'm doing the shuffling. Meanwhile, I'm going, they are so looking at that window going, what is that crazy lady doing? So finally I thought, you know, you just gotta, you gotta commit. So I get in the truck and I just pull forward and really closing my eyes as I'm pulling forward. To me, that's the best solution when you don't know what you're doing. Now, What's interesting about that is I really, I gave a talk about that whole experience after that because really there are words that have power. And in that moment for me, the things that I was expressing in that moment was an opportunity to settle down. And so during that time I was doing things like deep breathing, I was closing my eyes when I was unhooking the trailer. I was doing a host of things to try to get myself settled down and to have my adrenaline start to just drop in its levels of, that was pushing through my body. But fear is a funny thing. And believe me, in that moment, that fear wasn't triggered necessarily just by the trailer. It was by everything I've ever done in my life in which I'm afraid of doing it wrong and messing it up. In this particular case, I was afraid of destroying the trailer and the truck. And in itself, what was happening in that moment was that I was blind. If you had tried to talk me through it, I probably wouldn't have heard anything. And I really wasn't able to articulate exactly what was happening because I was in really a panic mode. Now, fortunately, I got the truck and trailer separated, went in and told them, you know, the trailer's out there ready. And the guy looks at me and he goes, you know, if you need help, all you have to do is ask. He said, but we really try not to offer help unless you ask. And as a woman, I kind of appreciate that because when we go camping, we get people ask us all the time just because we're women, hey, do you guys need help? And I could probably help the other person much more than they could help me. Because now we're talking almost 15 years later and we've gotten a bit of experience in our belt. I don't get nervous when I do things. I'm constantly repairing things on what we have now, which is a 35-foot motorhome. And when things happen, I don't get quite so scared and that's called practice, right? Well, the body remembers. The body remembers the events of our past and it remembers them based upon our perspective of the past. And there are certain things in the world right now that if you look at what's happening across our, the nation, across the planet, the way in which each one of us individually see things is based on our past. It's not based on what's happening. It's based on my own perspective, it's based on my own journey, my own traumas, my own stories, and so anytime I see something, it brings it up. So I'd like to talk about a word that has a lot of power that I believe is doing a lot of damage in our world. And I think the body remembers, and we've given so much power to this word, and even Ernest Holmes has talked about this word because he realizes the power we've given it. Ernest Holmes being the founder of Science of Mind. And that is the movement, not the thinking. So what we give power can have power over us. So last week, I know when Reverend John was here, he talked about the story of the Garden of Eden, of Eden and how Adam and Eve ate of the tree of good and evil. 
for those of you that were here. Let's see who was here and heard that story. It's a really great story. And let me just repeat that story because what I'm going to talk to you today is about the power of a particular word. Actually, both words, good and evil, have a lot of power. But when we use them and how we use them is really how they have power. So in the Garden of Eden, the serpent was considered the shrewdest of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And this is from the Bible itself. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? And the woman replied and said, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. And God said, you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you will die. Well, that's a pretty powerful um, threat, I think. But as women have the courage to go through childbirth, I think, the woman's like, you know, it can't be that bad. And what's interesting, though, is the serpent said, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with knowing both good and evil? The woman was convinced the tree was beautiful, the fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom of good and evil. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it, and then she gave some to Adam, who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, her eyes were open, and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. Now, why would you feel shame at knowing good and evil? Doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, if you take the story literally, you kind of sense, well, what does it really mean? And I've contemplated this story, and I've used this story a lot, because I think a lot of times, when you look at stories in the Bible, you have to look at them for what they are to teach us about humanity's understanding of the universe and what is God and what is divine. Think about the time that the story was written. I don't understand how the world works. I don't understand why, how weather shows up. I don't understand why some people are blessed and others aren't, because that was what humanity's sort of perspective was. The Bible being an absolutely interesting and wonderful history of humankind's spiritual evolution. So the knowledge of good and evil, what's wrong with that? Well, just imagine for just a moment, let's talk about good and evil. We characterize absolutely everything, don't we? Anything that shows up in our life immediately, we call it good or evil, good or bad, don't we? And absolutely everything, that means everyone too. The power of those two words are the power that we give them. And when we give that kind of power to words like good and evil, we distinguish between what is good and what is evil, which includes people of color, LGBTQ, women, anybody that's different than us. We immediately characterize people so that we're comfortable, we know who we're dealing with. And around the world, different sides are calling each other good or evil depending on the perspective. Evil has had such, I would say, significance. In fact, Ernest Holmes, said this, let me look for, evil of itself is neither person, place, nor thing, but it is only a certain use that we make of life. We call that evil which we feel is the wrong thing to do. But our ideas of good and evil change with the unfoldment of our thought about and belief in life. For what was thought to be good yesterday is today considered evil, and what yesterday was considered to be evil is today called good. I was watching a newscast. We were traveling for 10 days, drove our motor home up to Washington and back, and I hadn't really watched the news, and I typically don't really, but when I want to see sort of what the current sort of flavor of the world and how people are feeling, I'll turn the news on and see what's happening. And there was a newscaster, and he was really upset. You could tell he was physically, emotionally upset. And he was describing someone, and it happened to be a politician, and he said that this politician was both corrupt And then he stuttered, and he goes, and, 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 and. And he was trying to figure out, and he goes, and evil. And I thought, oh, interesting. Now, because I was giving this talk, I was paying more attention to the words that were being used. And what I felt was he really didn't know what to say. But evil is sort of that catch-all. But it's not a word that you can define, really, because everybody defines it differently. It could be moral, it could be bad choices, it could be a host of things, but evil is a word that is just kind of thrown out there when I don't know what to say. What's interesting, we do the same thing with love. 
Can you define love? No, you can kind of point to things and say what it is. Can you define evil? Each one of us have something different, a different meaning about it. You can point to things and say, well, that's evil. Is it really or is it just because I don't know what it is? But that word's been used casually and indiscriminately, and it's done a lot of harm in our world. I know there's been times in my life I've been called evil just because I happen to be part of the LGBT community. That felt so good. <laughs> Women have been called evil in religious story. Different people have been called evil. And it really comes down to a lack of understanding and a lack of knowing what it is I'm talking about. One of the things I find really beautiful right now, if any of you have been listening to or reading Brene Brown, she's been very clear about the fact, this is one thing I've gotten out of, I get only one thing from Brene Brown's new book, which is Atlas of the Heart, it's this, be clear. Be as clear as you can. Understand what you're feeling. Don't just throw a word out there because you don't know what else to say. If you don't know, say, I don't know. But it's really, really important to know that the words that we choose about ourselves and others have power. Ernest Holmes believed that evil didn't really exist, as in an evil power. Because really, how can an evil power exist from an infinite power? Why would an infinite power create two completely polar opposite powers? It doesn't seem logical. It doesn't seem possible. Why would God, this energy, this creative intelligence, create evil? Doesn't really make sense. Now, we make poor choices. We do things that sometimes we're not conscious really about how the effects of what we do, what we say, affect and hurt others. A lot of times we attach evil to something that's larger, like maybe a mass killing or something like that, and we say that's evil, but that's because we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand the pain that's going on in our world. We don't understand what people are feeling and what are they ingesting. We do know in this movement that the media has a huge responsibility, and it's really, really important although I don't think it's taken very seriously a lot. I actually happen to be a journalist by training and my prior career to being a minister. And journalism is about presenting the facts, not opinion. But that kind of news doesn't exist anymore. So when I do watch the news, I have to be very mindful of what I'm hearing, understanding that this is a person's story. And what are the stories that I'm most attracted to? Are they the ones that are deeply negative and disturbing? Because, you know, news is, is a money-making business. And its intention is to keep you watching it. And by the way, do you know where fear lives in your brain? Anyone? What did I hear? Yes. And it also lives in that there's that... Um, a uh, reptilian part of our brain in which is trying to keep us alive because we used to be chased by tigers and bears and, you know, wolves. But we're not anymore. Those, are the, those tigers, bears, and wolves are the thoughts in our heads that are chasing us. Not as dangerous, although sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? The things I think about myself can be pretty frightening. That part of our brain, that part of our body that responds, responds by habit because the body remembers the body remembers what to be afraid of. And again, I'm going to come back to the story about the Garden of Eden and the fact that why would it be, why would eating of the tree of good and evil not be a good thing according to God? Because then God says, well, now humanity, I'm being very careful about my word choice here, humanity now is like the gods. The gods, not God, the gods. That was in the Bible. So if we're like the gods, why is that a bad thing? Or why is that not a good thing? Or whatever it happens to be. And part of that is because we really aren't conscious. And that is the difference. That what we're doing in this life is, in essence, we are embedded with all the qualities and characteristics of the divine, but we're unconscious about it. So we're unconscious about the power of our words. We're unconscious about some of the actions that we take. 
And we're conscious when we characterize others. If I don't understand somebody and I describe or define them without really trying to get to know another person. You know, today is, June, is Juneteenth, which is our second year of it being a national holiday. What's significant about it is, yes, the state of Texas decided they would continue slavery until someone showed up and told them they couldn't. That's really kind of what happened. There was so much complexity about that time and with respect to how we as a people want to be responsible for not just our current but our past. That's important because what we give power to has power over us. Our bodies are always listening to our minds and following the instructions that they're given. And this is the instruction giver. And it tells us what to think. It tells us what to be afraid of. It tells us what is good. But we have to be careful. And I say careful in, let me use a different word, conscious. Because I think it's important to take risks. It's important to be conscious about the imprints that we've been given, how we've been raised, how we've been raised, how we see others as how we've been raised, how we've been instructed, what is safe, what is not, what is good, what is bad, what is good, what is evil. Personal, societal, and ancestral trauma is stored in our bodies. And ignoring them or using a spiritual bypass to gloss over the experience rather than heal it only lets the wound fester. Now that festering doesn't necessarily mean that I'm consciously suffering, but I, I am always suffering if I'm not conscious about what I'm doing in the world. And the worst part about it is if I'm not conscious about what I'm doing in the world, I'm also causing harm and pain to others. There's no way around it. What's really, really, I think, An opportunity in our movement is we're talking about waking up. We're talking about having a personal awakening to our, not only our lives, but how our lives affect others. Not just our lives, again, but if I'm not conscious about how my life affects another, then I'm not really conscious. Because then I'm only caring about me and what benefits me. And maybe that is evil if I'm only thinking about what benefits me. Our culture today sits a bit in a divisive place, doesn't it? We have a practice of avoidance and or blame. We either avoid topics or we blame people for how things are. And actually, we do that especially with ideas or events that we don't understand. And if I don't understand, it's up to me to come to that understanding. We participate in everything that's happening around us, by the way. Anything out there that we don't like, we've contributed to it. It's my conscious, my consciousness. And how can I affect, Marjorie said your favorite line was to create a world that works for everyone in there, and that is definitely part of the vision of Centers for Spiritual Living. The, the tough part about it is if it works for everyone, how's that gonna look right now? Some people, some people aren't going to be thrilled if it works for everyone because that means that I might be inconvenienced. It might mean, mean that I need to wake up a little bit. A world that works for everyone and who determines that when it does work for everyone? I think what's great about this movement, it says start with me Start with me, work on my consciousness, work on my biases, work on the things in my life that aren't working, but not exclusively. Because when I'm doing that, by the way, I remember when I first stepped into these doors, I was as unconscious as you could be. I was self-loathing. I was dealing with a lot of anxiety. I was in a lot of pain. And I was walking through a beginning of a journey that was going to lead me to a really a place of peace and bliss with respect to mostly who I am and what I'm feeling. But what I've noticed about this journey is the more I wake up, the more I wake up. 
The more I wake up, the more the need it is to wake up more. Sue Monk Kidd said in her book, The Dissident Daughter, she says, when I wake up, does it mean I need to wake up more? And that's constant. You don't know what you don't know until you know. And then you know, you know, and the more we know, the, more, the less we know, right? The, the challenge about the body is that it responds to beliefs that we carry with us, but it also responds to the beliefs that we imagine or assume about that others have too. There's a tendency to bypass our feelings and consider our beliefs going to quick generalizations. Now, for those of you in the room that have studied science of mind, and I'm gonna look at practitioners in the room, don't think you don't, you should not know this answer, right? <laughs> What's another word for generalization? When you generalize a people, when you generalize a situation, what did Ernest call that? Starts with an R. Next letter is an A. <laughs> Next letter is a C. Race consciousness. That's what Ernest called it. He said, any time that I generalize, it's a bypass. I've characterized, I've labeled, and I've just put it out there because honestly, the brain and humanity and its brain always wants to shortcut and let's just get to the bottom line. When we bottom line everything, and I'm a bottom liner, man, I am just, when I'm talking to somebody and we're talking a problem, I'm saying, just get to the bottom line, people. <laughs> right? But the information between the beginning of whatever it is that we're discovering, it's not getting to the bottom line, it's the journey getting to what I come up with. When I generalize, I'm missing and pushing out even further an opportunity for me to wake up in my own consciousness to have an effect on my own life and therefore have an effect on the life that we share with others. To heal the systems that are in place in our world today that create widespread trauma, which there are, even if I don't happen to be affected, which I think I'm not affected by any system that is skewed towards an individual or a group of people, and I'm not aware of it, I am creating trauma because I'm perpetuating those systems. That's a lot of responsibility. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah. But I don't have to take it all on. I don't. I have to be willing to open up, to learn about my own trauma, to learn about my own biases, and start right here. Yes. That's the first thing I get to do. That's the big work, by the way. Imagine if, and Ernest said this in his Sermon on the Sea, he said, give me a thousand people who do that and you can change the world. Because there's a tipping point. All you need is a small percentage for a tipping point. So, How we look at our world, how we describe what words we use, what perspectives we choose, because we do choose them. We affirm them every time we choose it over and over again. How we choose to do that is our work. Now, how can we affect a change? Well, one, let's just start with this word evil that I've been talking about. Taking a word like that and being conscious of my use of words like that affects a huge change. If we believe that we're all one, which I think we intellectually believe that, but I don't know that we know how to practice that because it's such a big word. And it's a spiritual principle that is probably more difficult to understand because if we did practice oneness, 
rooms like this would be full. They'd be full. That's not saying that we're doing something wrong, though. Let's not go right to judgment or criticism. It's an opportunity to look at, which I think Sil Beach is doing beautifully, and at Namaste we're doing the same thing, which is how can we be more about oneness? What am I missing? So we've been exploring things in our community with respect to how can we do this more? And recently we did a visioning and it really inspired me because in this particular course of the visioning that we were doing, in the past it was visioning around a new building or the financial challenges we were having or walking through whatever it was. But in this particular case recently, none of that was present. What was present was that we need to build bridges, that we need to look at ourselves and build bridges. Julian of Norwich, how many of you have heard of Julian of Norwich? Okay, Julian of Norwich lived during the bubonic plague. The plague that, how devastating, two out of every three people in Europe died from the bubonic plague. Can you imagine two out of every three people you know die? Julian of Norwich lived during that time and she wrote of that time and you would think that the darkness that was present in that particular situation would have had her say, well, this is just evil. But this is what she said. One of the things that she said as far as how can we address a time that feels dark, a time that feels difficult? She said, one thing to do is examine our goals and intentions. Strip everything down to the essential question. Why am I here? What and whom do I wish to serve? What is the best contribution I can make given my particular gifts and background? And not knowing how long I will live. She didn't say, you know, I'll start tomorrow because I've got time. She started today. She started in this moment. Richard Rohr said this, he says, you cannot contain evil by shaming it or making people feel guilty, but only by revealing it toward it is and then seeing the good as better. We need to look at things that we characterize and say, what is this really? And what is this bringing up in me? Not just immediately characterizing. And this is what I sort of in my own life believe. If you want to heal it, you have to feel it. And for those of you, like me, that don't like to feel it, which is why I say that, I don't like to feel sadness, I don't like to feel frustration or anger, or all of that, but if I will sit in it and feel it, I will get to the bottom of what it is. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the most powerful thing we can do. If we are angry or frustrated with anything, that is the antidote to it. Because within that, there is a story and a story whose time has come to heal. And the last thing is this. In the past, as communities, we've tend to focus on only our own, only our own within the walls. And sometimes we sort of reach out, and one of the things Namaste is really leaning into is building bridges with other communities that are similar to not just do our own thing, to not worry about just our own community, but to work with communities like Seal Beach, to work with other communities, not just giving, but to actually work with. I was doing some work down in South Orange County and one of the things that came up, it was part of an ecumenical council that I had created down there and one of the things that came up in that council was the fact that they did not know who Centers for Spiritual Living was, they did not know what we were about, and they did not know what we stood for. And that's because most of the time, and honestly, I get it, as ministers, I feel it myself, we're so overwhelmed sometimes, there's so much to do, that it's enough to do what's in these four walls. But honestly, some of those things we don't need to do. We're here to make a difference in the world. I'm here to support the healing of anyone that I come in contact with. I'm here to be a good, a beneficial presence. And if I start with that, then what I focus on becomes very clear. So will you pray with me?
So as we come here together on this day, this beautiful Sunday, this day in which God, Spirit, has made and everything in this room and outside this room that breathes and moves and exists, being all that is God, for God exists as all things. That there's nothing, not only just in my experience, but everything in my experience, whether I understand or don't understand, everything that is part of that is also God. I know I'm one with it, and I know that each person in this room is as well. And I know that every creation on this planet, within the universe, is God. So from today, I affirm and declare as true that every word that I speak, I am more and more conscious each conversation I have. I set the attention right here and right now to be mindful of the power and the choice of the words that I use. And instead in giving power to words that I don't want to have power. I will seek to understand and explore further so that I may truly be in integrity with my word. I just bless this space today in this community, knowing that its work is good and very good. And so it is. Amen. Thank you.